Okay, so MA, nice to speak with you. Um, this is the first one of these I'm doing. I'm not sure you were aware of that. Um, so uh, it's nice to be kind of working this out together. Um, yeah. And uh, as I think I mentioned to you before, I've not introduced you or I'm not doing any kind of preliminary introductions. So it'd be great if you could uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, sure, yeah, I'm an English teacher. I've been teaching for almost 23 years now and I teach in a private international school. Uh, I teach IGCSE and I also teach in the American High School program. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I gather you're currently teaching online and in the current circumstances, it would be, I think, remiss to not mention that and uh, spend a little bit of time talking about how that's affected you and how you're finding that. Uh, yes, we have gone to online uh, learning and I'm in, this is now going into week six of online learning. We had two weeks where we were on spring break. So although we've been locked down for eight weeks, we've been doing six weeks of online learning. And my students, all of our students at, at our school have one-to-one -one devices. So they either have an iPad or a MacBook. So they are very connected. Great. We use a learning management system. And it's been stressful. I think we've had similar experiences as other teachers sure. around the world, sure. um, but we're all figuring it out together. So. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like, at least on the technology side and, and a few other things, you had some of that in place already, I gather. Yes, we had our learning management system up and running, but it wasn't used to deliver the content on a wide basis. Some okay. teachers were using it, but not everyone. And we were using uh, also other learning systems like Shobi and, and we, teachers were doing things digitally, but not to the extent obviously that they're doing now. Okay. And how about you? Is this, has this been a big difference for you, the online teaching compared to what you were doing before and how much tech were you using before? I've always used a lot of tech uh, as an Apple Distinguished Educator. It's okay. kind of my, my thing. And sure. so I've delivered the course content through the learning management system for a long time since September. So learning that and doing that was not a big difference for me. Okay. Using the tech, not difficult for me. However, think, rethinking how to teach in a crisis situation is absolutely new and the sure. things that were common sense to teaching from before yeah. are not common sense anymore so yeah of course yeah um it's been so obviously <laughs> yeah yeah i can imagine i can imagine uh so obviously um obviously there's going to be big differences between the way you're teaching right now and the way you were teaching uh you know before all this um, but you say you've been doing this now for six weeks uh sort of since the program was implemented so what do you think you've develop within that six weeks? How do you think you're doing things differently now from when you first made the move to online? And obviously at that moment, it was a shock for you and a big change, but what have you developed and changed and, and improved within that six weeks, do you think? I think I have improved in the amount of content that I'm delivering to the students, uh, okay. yeah. the, ex the expectations for the amount of, of coursework that we're gonna be getting through. And I have, increased the amount of interaction and the amount of student choice in what they're doing and how they're showing their learning oh, that good. has that has really changed and once i got comfortable with the schedule of how my planning and rolling out of the course is different in online learning mm -hmm. the pacing mm -hmm. is completely yeah, different sure. once i got a hold of that i believe that things are going more smoothly now and yeah. we're all just kind of calming down about yeah that's uh, really good the frenzy so. yeah that's really good yeah i just started doing my uh my course online for the first time so for a while there i was uh i was not really doing anything um and so i've just got into the the online teaching so i've only been doing it for for just under a week now uh so it's still very new for me um and yeah the pacing has been a, a big um I knew it would be different, but quite how different uh, is, has been a bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, yeah, like you, that's one of the big things I'm having to get to grips with um, and relatively quickly because it's a fairly short course that I'm running, you know, so I want to try to get on top of that um, early on so that the, the majority of the course can, can run as smoothly as I, uh, as I can. Um, so yeah, pacing has been one of those uh, kind of 
having to hit the ground running and 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 kind of I've had to change a lot to to try and suit the pacing. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that the mistake that I made early on was really racing down that road of trying. I was cautious, but I was still going down the road of trying with those synchronous live calls and right. delivering long video content to the students. Right. And I needed to back way off of that. Right. That was not effective. But yeah. the one thing I would say that was consistently effective and still remains so, and you can never go wrong with this, is the relationships and maintaining right. the relationships with the students. When you do that, even if the content doesn't get there, you're still maintaining that connection. And I've never had to back off of that. Yeah, that's, that's really always. good. Yeah. Yeah. And so valuable. Um, so I, I, I watched some of your other videos, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. Um, and I see there that, as you've just suggested, you know, you're, you're putting out video content and you've kind of changed your approach on that a little bit. Um, but I, so are you also then still making live calls with the students in groups for that relationship building or are you doing more one on one calls or how are you managing that? Well, for the um, the live full class, very rarely now. Right. OK. I pull them into the call and then. I will put them into smaller groups. So right, Zoom okay. works really well for that, but with yeah. the security yeah. issues, people are, are, are nervous. So I did it through Teams. Yeah. Yeah. So putting them into small groups and have them talk amongst themselves, that I still do. Uh, whole group discussion, almost never. Right. And I will also use the feature of just opening a call, leaving it open, yeah, and okay. then getting on with my work and then students can drop in. Yeah. and ask questions as they're working asynchronously through the course material. Yeah, okay. And how are the students responding to that? Do you find they're enthusiastic to, to get in touch with you and, and come and ask you questions in the open time? They are, not all of them. I find that my students with learning differences use that more often okay. than the others. Um, some of them say, oh, we know what we're doing, we just wanna get on with it. But to jump in to a call and ask a quick question and jump back out, it's been mm -hmm. fine. Okay. And it, otherwise, the, to maintain those relationships, I've been contacting students personally. If I notice that I really keep careful, con, uh, um, careful, I don't know the word, I, careful control over who's been handing in work and who's been right. uh, interacting with me and the ones yeah, I okay. don't hear from, I send out a little note to say, where are you? I miss you. Yeah, Let yeah, me know. Yeah. How's it going? That has been really effective yeah. too. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I, in my, uh, when I'm teaching in, in class, I always try to incorporate a fair amount of library time into the, the courses that I teach. Um, and so uh, obviously that's trying to give as much freedom to the students as possible. Um, but then also I'm always there. And so uh, I'm having to think of ways and I'm not yet done it, but I'll be trying out the same kind of open call uh, situation in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I'm yet to see, you know, what the uptake is on, on that. Um, but uh, no, it's, uh, it's something I'll be trying as well. So I'm glad it's worked out for you. Yeah, and I think it's different depending on your population and what your sure. school expectations are and what your course expectations are. Students yeah. who want to learn and want to be there yeah. um, will just move through your course because it's engaging and, and, and inter interesting. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we have a different level of care that we have to provide being a, a private school. So Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And very different sets of expectations, of course. Yeah. OK. Um, so yeah, we before the call, um, we kind of lighted on a couple of topics that I think uh, would be interesting to, to discuss. Um, and um, I'll likely let you take the lead on those. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll both be able to kind of. Um, have a bit of input. Um, and uh, to begin with, uh, I'd like to just hear a little bit more about the reflections that you're doing, your self-reflection. So I've uh, been through and watched a couple of the videos that you've posted. I've not seen them all yet, um, but uh, I've, I've you know, had a flick through and, and watched a few of them. So just tell us um, what gave you the idea to do that and uh, what kind of value you found out of that. Uh, yeah, I don't, think I'm intending that everybody watches every one of them yeah. because they're, you know, that they're really a personal thing. And I encourage people to have that personal reflection, whether you yeah. publish them or not, is not really important. I got the idea, like the first day before we even started meeting with the students, I got the idea of this 
is going to need some reflection at some right. point. And, and I want to keep track of how it's going for me in this environment. And it, it was giving me some kind of purpose to, to my daily routine. I needed to build that in early right. on yeah, nice. in that crisis. Right. And my intention was to do a daily diary in written form because I'm an English mm -hmm. teacher. My preferred medium is words. But then I thought, oh, I'll never get to it. It won't, it won't happen. So I decided yeah. I'm going to make these short, you know, under three minute videos and I will just line them up and reflect on what I'm doing in the classroom. Uh, I wanted it to be practical. I wanted it to be a reevaluation, sort of like in that um, idea of planning, implementing and evaluating process. I uh -huh. wanted it to be part of my evaluation yeah, of the new things that I was going to be trying in the classroom. So I was, I spend, I do that in the morning and I just do the three minutes and reflect on what was happening in the classroom the day before yeah. or something that sparks my curiosity or yeah, interest. Yeah, yeah, good. And then is there anything concrete apart from the, you know, the kind of ambient realizations that, that you might have during that? Is there anything concrete that you do after the, after you've recorded your video? Is there anything then you sit down and, and, and make or do or report anything afterwards? Well, I definitely look at the, the data that's coming out of the lesson, whatever curious, curious thing that I'm doing. I don't know how else to describe it other than I'll try something. And usually it comes yeah. out of a, what I feel like to be a failure that I end up reevaluating. Right. So if something's right. going well, I'm just like, yay, that's great. And yeah, I right. move on. But right. it's where, where something doesn't quite work and then yeah. I notice it then I have to examine it more yeah. carefully, look at the data coming out of that, and then reevaluate and adjust. And that's the process that I find most engaging. And including students in that has been successful. So yeah, that's what them, Yeah, that's what I really liked about the few that I saw was including the responses and the feedback that you've had from students. Yeah. So say a little bit more about how that's gone and, and, and how the students have responded to that. Well I just get on there and I say, hey, I noticed that no one did the thing or whatever it was right. and then i'm like can you tell me why and they are super honest and they will yeah. just tell you miss it was too long mm -hmm. too long mm -hmm. didn't watch yeah <laughs> right kind yeah. Of thing. and they you know i was like okay so what can i do to make that better or some yeah. of them said it, completely not what i thought was the problem they're like your instructions were not clear we right. you're, you're you gave us some audio instructions and then you gave us written instructions and yeah. then we didn't scroll down to see what those instructions were. Mm. So shorter is better, which is always a struggle for me. Yeah. Right. Uh, and less, t less writing, more visual video, yeah, sure, sure. something like that. Yeah. But they, that's yeah. what they told me because the instructions were unclear because they had to click from one place to another place. Multiple clicks is also danger yeah. zone. Yeah, I think it's um, that centralization that helps, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And they told me the honest truth. And then I went back and said, oh, okay, great. And then, of course, later you stumble upon the research that tells you <laughs> we, yeah, under, under nine already. minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah you right. know, and you're like, okay, thanks. That's what yeah. I mean by the fog that's around yeah, us yeah, in this right. environment. Yeah. You know, we can't, we, we know it as teachers. We know don't do anything that's overly long, but then we keep right. doing it. Right. So. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, it's one of those that that is something that certainly I and I think many teachers find difficult. And I think, again, that is one of the one thing in particular that I think a lot of us do know. And yet we still we still uh, push those boundaries because I know it's true for me. I uh, one of the main principles that I kind of hold up is maximizing the, the student input, maximizing the amount of time that students are practicing, students are using, students are talking. Um, and therefore minimizing the amount of time that I'm doing all of those things. And yet I could, most of the topics that I teach and most of the lessons that I find myself in, I could go on talking for an hour if nobody stopped me. And so I really have to control that. And you know, most lessons, I think I do a decent job of controlling myself, but I think even now, most of the lessons I teach, I could cut down on some of that. There's still areas that I could cut that out. And I think a lot of teachers, I'd like to think, a lot of teachers find themselves in a, in a similar position. Oh, for sure. And we think that we have to tell them everything. And that's right. our job right. is to, to deliver it all. And one of the students told me, look, I, when you do it all for us, there's no room for us of course, yeah. to find yeah. our own way through the yeah. content. 
And yeah. in this kind of an environment, we have to make decisions about what we're cutting and what we're right. leaving in. Right. I think if we focus on process and we focus on skills as opposed to tasks, we're probably allowing students to find their own way through content. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, what's what's heartening for me, again, that's one of the principles that I uphold is that the students should be, you know, at the at the center and in charge of that process as much as possible, which I think um, within the field of education is a relatively new um, principle. Right. And there have always been some people who, who knew that, but certainly in the mainstream, it's still not a common idea now, I think. But what I find most heartening is that I'm seeing more and more students realize that as well. Uh, so more and more students are actually asking for the freedom and asking for, um, you know, asking to be put out on their own and, and left in charge and uh, left with some questions and some mystery where, you know, that wasn't common in the, the teaching approach. And I don't think students necessarily cared or wanted it for a long time, or at least it didn't seem that way. And now I'm seeing more and more, as, as you've seen with your own students, uh, the students want that freedom and they want that independence. Um, and uh, it's great when teachers can give it to them. Yeah, that is that is straight up the, the the direction we need to be going. And but it's difficult when you're the classroom teacher and you're rolling out courses and material yeah, right, that, of course. you know, we don't have the time to sit back and reflect on these things and think about how am I assessing? Why am I assessing? What's the yeah. purpose? And yeah. uh, I think some of us have used this enforced pause to do that and i yeah. can see those people coming out all over you know social media and and yeah, teacher yeah. Sites. so that's exciting i think that's a positive change in a difficult time yeah no i agree um i've been trying to start various conversations and and you know interactions and things on uh, various social media platforms for a while now and for a you know corners of the internet that are so active in conversation, I found there was a, a dearth of discussions about education and, and kind of, you know, professional and practical conversations amongst teachers for such a long time. And I am seeing now far more uptake on these kinds of, uh, you know, questions and discussions, um, uh, whether it's because people are finding themselves at home at their laptop more, you know, for longer and more frequently, or because they are being, you know, the, the triggered to, to think more, um, and more deeply about their practice um, or a combination of those, I'm definitely seeing a lot more kind of meaningful practical interaction, which is, uh, I think, great. Uh, obviously, the background to all of this is, is tragic, but I think, you know, I'm really happy to see some of the, uh, some of the reaction that, that especially teachers are, are having uh, in that very positive direction. Um, so, no, that's great. Um, yeah, I, before I think move, the oh, yeah, point about it, sorry, I think your point oh, about yeah, it being being a trigger for deeper learning amongst teachers and, and practitioners is is really important. Often the complaints I see from teachers is people keep telling us what to do and people keep voicing their opinion, but they're not in the classroom every day. Right. And yeah. the aspect of teaching to move up in teaching, you move out of the classroom. And here we find people who are still in the classroom sharing maybe not their expertise, you know, they're not the experts, but they're sharing what they are doing. They're sharing what they're, they're discovering about themselves yeah. and about their students. And to me, I'd rather listen to the people who are in the classroom yeah. than yeah. the people who are pontificating about, let's move education in this direction or that direction. Tell me yeah. what I'm supposed to be doing tomorrow. Yeah. Tell yeah, me no, this absolutely. kind of thing. Absolutely. And it's funny, yeah, you use the word expert there. It's funny, um, I saw, I won't go down this rabbit hole now, but I saw a post today on online, uh, somebody suggesting that, experience isn't isn't worth anything um and that kind of i wasn't sure maybe it was just a bit of good old-fashioned trolling i'm not sure but it was certainly uh, not worth much of uh, much much consideration but it does kind of uh you just mentioned that you know teachers in the classroom who may or may not be the or consider themselves experts uh, but one thing i found has been that um while experience is valuable i think that's a fairly obvious statement um, any small amount of experience can be really valuable. And so I've found that working with brand new teachers who are just kind of having their first lessons in the classroom, sometimes the insights that they have to offer because they are coming from the outside, but they are in the inside. So they know what they're talking about, but they've got a very different uh, perspective on things. Um, they're still much more malleable, perhaps, than some of the, you know, longer service teachers. Um, so, yeah, these, you know, just 
this opportunity to hear more voices from more teachers, whether they are long serving or brand new um, novice teachers, um, has just been great to get so many new perspectives and different practices and approaches and different experiences that people are having, especially now. Um, what I find really interesting about this current situation is it's the first time, certainly in my life, where we've truly been able to say that everybody in the world is currently sharing an experience. And yet, of course, it's very different for, for different people, the way that we're experiencing it and, and what it means and how it's affecting different people, of course, has been very different. Um, and so there's so much to be said and so much to hear from the people that have something to say. Um, and so yeah, it's, it's, it's great to just, they don't need to be in the form of a webinar or an article, just people sharing their voices and their opinions and talking about what happened in their lessons um, has been, I think, really valuable for, for a lot of us. Yeah, that sharing out, I I have wanted to see a place for that that's so solely dedicated to that for a long time. And Twitter seems to be very messy and yeah, and, I can't and yeah, I can't get into it. Yeah, yeah. And then LinkedIn seems to be a bit more on again a different vibe. And you also have other things other than education. So course, I'm yeah. finding that uh, this platform EdSpace is working well to okay. be able to share quick. Uh, tips or questions um, and it's only for education so that right. is a platform designed only for that it, it okay. works I'd like to see more voices on there sure, yeah. I think well I don't know grow. yeah that's great it's new so it's doesn't have many people on now but it should grow and it's like it's our our space dedicated only to educators so that's really good you know, yeah. something oh, no, to look good. at yeah. Now, one thing I found, and I've, I've said this so many times, and I'm sure this will come up in, in future videos as well. Um, whenever you're on a kind of a, a forum or social platform, the, you know, the various different types of things that are out there that has categories, uh, I always find that education is the missing category. They'll have a technology, a fashion, a movie, an art, uh, and, you know, just such a long list of possible categories. And education or teaching is just sort of never on the list. Um, and so there's very, very rarely a place that you can go as, as a teacher to find a dedicated space to talk to other teachers. And so something like LinkedIn, you know, has a, a wide network of people who are teachers. And so there's a great opportunity to connect, to connect there. But again, it's not a dedicated space. It's not a, it's not kind of a, a corner that we can call our own. Um, so now that ed space, I, I shall have to look at. It's, uh, it's new for me. That's great. Yeah. So the other thing uh, that, we wanted to talk about and I think I can see a bit of a link perhaps between uh, the topic of reflection and self-reflection um, and then uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about assessment as well so I, I gather you've been kind of doing a bit of thinking and this has been for a long time now one of my main areas of thought as well I just uh, there's so much that I think we need to overhaul and, and, and readdress when it comes to assessment so what uh, what is on your mind of late when it comes to assessment? Uh everything everything from the larger questions to the tiny things in my classroom the larger questions are unsettling and overwhelming i find with the cancellation of all the external exams right and then i'm watching these large organizations respected bodies making decisions for students that i don't find ideal right. and it questions everything it puts everything at at risk of not being true anymore which is a good thing but also a scary thing when you've been yeah. relying on these governing bodies to tell right. you what your worth is you right. know like, i mean now they're telling us well we don't know we'll just make something up and then you think <laughs> you don't actually know right and maybe yeah. the classroom teacher knows better who knows yeah. i don't know yeah. but so yeah. those are scary and sometimes we back away from that and we say well we'll just leave that to the experts to figure out but i think we need to press and question and, and demand better that these governing bodies who are giving us their exams and qualifying our students, they need to do better by students. And that is yeah. something is a bigger conversation. If you think about back into my little hole of my classroom, which is where I do my best work, mm -hmm. um, the idea of assessing my students, you know, how can my students apply their knowledge how can they create something that shows me that their skills or their knowledge and can they take a stand on something justify that that's where i'm trying to push my thinking yeah, so that's one, one use of assessment 
and also using that assessment to tell me where I need to go next. Right. Yeah. So it's informing me, but also I uh, judging them, you know, what, yeah, what right, can they do? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the bigger philosophical questions are important and they're interesting to me, but in a practical sense, I still have to be able at the end of this year to tell my administration how each student has performed to standard. Yeah. So yeah. I have to find ways to do that and find yeah. ways to do it in it creatively. Yeah. So, yeah, you know. I think um, even the way that you're describing there, though, I think something that's really important um, is you're using words like, you know, phrases like what they can do, um, which is a small change in terminology, but such a huge step away from uh, what they know. Right. Um, and I, I don't think there's anything revolutionary. And yet we don't see any change in this in this direction. But for a long time, testing has been so focused on what the students know, what they have kind of memorized and remembered. And by the end of the year, what they've managed to retain before they forget it all again after the summer holiday anyway. Right. Um, right, just, right. Just being able to focus on what they are actually able to do. Um, I tend to think not only have I preferred that approach um you know just kind of uh pedagogically speaking but also i tend to find that the things you can do are also the things that stick with you for much longer so what if we assess somebody today on what they know chances are a week from now if we give them the same test they'd have forgotten a lot of it and they get a much lower result but if we test someone today on what they can do what they're capable of achieving and then test them again a week six weeks you know six months from now I tend to find that that is retained quite well. It's a much more, um, you know, much more reliable uh, assessment that will show us what our students are, are likely to achieve in the future, where the tests of knowledge that, that are more traditional, I find, uh, give, us very little not, give us very little insight into the future of these students. So yeah, I wonder what I you found in that, in that line. I completely agree with you that focus on skills. So stop giving feedback on tasks right. and give feedback on the skill. Right. And I think that's the way we need to start thinking of assessment. As, you know, it, it should be assessment for learning, assessment as learning. Um, it should be informative as opposed to that more traditional way. It's not that we haven't never questioned the tr that, that of way. Of course, yeah. But we never knew how to break out of it. Right. And, uh, uh, this, is take, this is what's happening now is that people are realizing they are free to yeah. assess in a way that feels more natural and feels more effective for the yeah. students. Yeah. And, you know, when we don't have a lot of time, I don't know if you're finding this, but I'm finding the ability to give meaningful feedback on all of the tasks that I'm asking them to do. Mm -hmm. I can't do it in this environment. Yeah. It's yeah. exhausting. Yeah. So I've decided I'm going to stop. I'm going to automate as much as I can. Sure and feedback on skills and interact with students about their work rather than mark their work, if yeah, that makes no, sense. No, I, I like that. And there's, uh, the other thing is, I mean, there's so much there I want to respond to. Um, so first of all, yeah, just briefly, one, another, another example of good coming from bad um, is <laughs> many, many teachers are finding, not all, there are, some, there are some really, really great examples of good management, but a lot of teachers are finding uh, that it's the, the management side that are really kind of flailing now and they don't know what to do and the teachers feel kind of on their own the principals uh, aren't able to kind of give them any meaningful guidance um, and obviously that leaves a lot of teachers in chaos but some good that comes from that is like you say it the 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 flip side of that is a sudden freedom uh, because the principals don't know what to do about it and they don't know what to tell us to do and so the teachers are just finding well no one's looking and we're kind of we're in charge for once um, and so mm -hmm. it's giving teachers a lot more room to kind of experiment and in a lot of cases I think do things that they always wish they could um, it's, I, I think for a lot of teachers they, they knew for much longer that things weren't right but they either felt they didn't have time or they didn't have the freedom and the flexibility to, to try and do things and now suddenly um, you know, no one's kind of giving them the oversight, which in the past mm -hmm. was perhaps overbearing and restricting. And now suddenly teachers are finding that they, they can kind of uh, try things out. And uh, there's not as much risk of, of, of you know, which is not as much risk as perhaps once was threatened, you know. Uh, so I think that's been, been a, a bit of good from bad there. I don't For know sure. how, that, how that rings uh, true with you. 
A, a colleague said to me early on in the process, I kept saying, when are they going to tell us? When are they, what's coming? Why are they not communicating with us? And he said, no one's coming to save you. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And I was kind of offended in a way. Like, sure. well, what, you know, and then I thought, wait a minute, this is my chance. Sure. You know? yeah, and yeah. and I, I do feel guilty. I did feel guilty about being positive or excited about it because so many people right. are suffering and right. and struggling right now but i i still feel excited that we could change this for the better yeah that this yeah. bad bad situation could mean better learning for students yeah. and i i don't know how to not i i don't feel guilty about that no i, I mean i think the thing that would be most disappointing of all and something that i'm actually really quite worried about um, and I've had this conversation with a few different people, um, is to think that we might come out the other side of this, um, which is great because it means the health scare is over, right? So we'll come out the other side of this and everybody will be in good health and, and ready to move on. And then we'll all just sink back into the old systems um, and there won't be any change. Now, that would be the most disappointing uh, outcome, I think, uh, of all, because there are so many people seeing the the cracks in the old system and the light in the in the, the end of this tunnel um but you know although this is a unprecedented size of event you know we've never been through anything quite this dramatic before but i think we all have seen uh smaller instances of um possibility and potential then just get steamrolled under the the old system and the way things were always done and very very quickly just falling back into old habits and old patterns um, and that's something i really would hate to see um, but i think for once it is in the hands of individual teachers right so if the individual teachers put something into place that works then there's no reason not to keep doing those things um, so so that i think there's a bit of promise there yeah and and perhaps then those teachers can take that and and bend the old system to fit yeah. the way that we prefer to work yeah and for us anyway we're going to be regardless of whether whether when we go back uh, some of my colleagues are going back on monday uh, mm. but how much learning is going to be taking place i don't know because the change yeah. change in this environment is very unsettling once you've course, settled yeah. in your six weeks now you're going to be asked to do something different that's that's yeah. uh, hard but the idea that even the finish of the year will finish around end of june right but we're still going to do distance learning design and right. so yeah, we can solidify some of those habits yeah and make them have well make them habits first yeah. and then solidify right. those maybe we can carry those into the next year and make the system bend to yeah. what we're doing yeah that yeah. would be the ideal um yeah. but that means that we need people who are sharing with other teachers and having conversations about right. what can that look like in a practical sense right and that's the discussion that that needs to be spread through yeah. different different venues like we're doing now you know, returning yeah. to something what can the practical what practical things can teachers do right now in their classroom right. that that right. will lead us in that direction right so yeah and i'd like to build directly on that actually and go back to um what you were saying about assessments and, and how your approach to assessing has um has been changed a little bit um yeah i mean the idea is that you, you've already put forth about perhaps marking less and giving more meaningful feedback um yeah i think <laughs> it's sometimes easy or sometimes it gets forgotten um, that the students on the other side of this, you know, if for teachers marking, uh, you know, is just the bane of the of the profession, right? I think most teachers would agree with that. Um, but the flip side of that, unfortunately, is you know, as much time as much as we don't have the time to spend on all that marking and mountains of of, of you know marking and feedback and assessment, uh, students don't really have the time to engage with what they're getting either. So it's it's futile because you're spending all this time on something that you don't really believe in which you then give to the students and they don't have the time to really engage with it and think about it anyway so you know for the longest time it's it's been such a broken concept anyway um and moving towards a feedback model rather than a marking model um i think is has been a long time coming um and i think it's one of those things that the, the teachers and students will both appreciate um 
So yeah, I'd like to hear just a little bit about how you've been doing that. If, uh, if you can maybe, I don't know if you can give us one example of an assessment activity that you've, that you've done recently and how you've then given feedback on that. Sure, I can. Um, just a word about that feedback. I love what you said about feedback versus marking because that feedback can be explored in all of its senses. So you can have teacher to student feedback. You can right. have um, student to teacher feedback. You can yes, have peer to peer feedback and that self-assessment piece. Right. They can be doing all of those things and you Absolutely, haven't touched yeah. a piece of work. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's so true. I, yeah. you know, I think that's kind of where we need to go because that's focusing on process. And uh, yeah. I would say sticking with one assignment a little bit longer than we're, yeah. than it's habitual for us yeah. and pressing students to take a deeper look, they're yeah. going to hate it at first yeah. because they like to tick and move on. Yeah. But, but also, yeah, just to, sorry to, yeah, that's right. And also, you know, just sorry to interrupt there, but this it's idea good. of, as you said, tick and move on and, and talking about process because some, sometimes, you know, an assignment, whether it's an assignment or an exam that they're preparing for, the buildup can be so long, right? If they're revising for an exam, when they know they've got an exam six weeks from now, so they're going to spend the next six weeks revising for that exam, or they've got an assessment where they've got, you know, four weeks to work on, a, on, on an assessment. Uh, and during that four weeks, obviously, depending on the teacher's commitment here, sometimes they might get some quite valuable support while they're working. But in any kind of formal terms, they don't get anything until they get that score. And then, as you say, they move on, which means the it's immediately just kind of forgotten. It's a thing of the past. They got the score, they got their tick, and they move on. Um, and by moving to a feedback model, uh, what I like to do the most is to spend more time giving feedback before the assignment's even been handed in. Right? What, sort of giving the students kind of guidance and feedback on, on the process and hearing from them. I like to get my students to, to keep kind of a diary, uh, like a working diary as they're going along to say, this is what I've done this week. And, you know, these are the challenges that I found. Uh, this is why I'm struggling with the project. This is what I'm liking about the project. And then as you, you know, you're not just talking about the product, but it's the, the process. It's the, it turns the assessment into a learning experience of its own. So they're not just testing, but they're still, it's, it's additional learning. It's learning on top of learning. Um, and I think there's so much value in that. And as you said, then all the different directions that that can go. Right. And I'll, I'll, respond to that and then give you a practical example yeah, from great, my yeah, class yeah. but your idea of document of watching the process that your students are going through they can pro they can document that process yes and put right. that up to you as evidence of their learning yep, and exactly right, i saw yeah. a colleague doing that through um, a padlet where they said take a picture of your work now and then do a little timeline of your pr work through the process and it worked well because it was an art project so they could show the right, yeah, yeah. development of the piece over time from my class my practical example is that uh, my students did a piece of writing uh, these are students in the IGCSE course and they did a piece of writing and I read them briefly not taking any note, I mean, not, not making any marks on it. I just read through a few of the answers and I started seeing things uh, come out as, you know, problem areas for many, many students. And I thought, well, I can just sit here and type my responses back to them, or I can voice record my responses, which is right. also a great tool. Yeah. Or, so I'll spend all the time doing that. And then they'll say, great, thanks. And then they'll move on to the next assignment. So instead, what I did was, I made a walkthrough screencast of my feedback to the class. Right. And I tried to keep that under six minutes. It was uh -huh. tough. Didn't tell them everything. I just said, here's some things I'm seeing. Remember to keep these things in mind. Mm -hmm. Gave the feedback to them. And the next lesson, I said, watch that. Revise your piece. Yeah. When you're happy with your piece, hand it in. Yeah. And I gave them two different videos, one on uh, the, the writing part of the assignment yeah. and one on the, the, this is the content that you should have in it. Mm -hmm. And so then they went back, they revised and they've handed those in. And I'm hoping, I haven't looked at them yet, 
but I'm hoping now when I put eyes on it for the first time in a, a, a real way, they will be much higher quality yeah, than they were before, yeah. let's hope. And then my marking will be faster because there will be yeah. fewer things to point out. I'll be like, yay, good job, move on. Um, yeah. But uh, how I'm gonna give the feedback to them now on those final pieces, now is where we can get individual. And yes, we can right. see where students were not taking the advice or taking the understanding and moving it forward. And some will be ready to go. This is yeah. this may be a consequence of this process is that they'll end up, some are ready to move on to the next thing and some need more practice on that. Right, sure, yeah, yeah. Now I remember one of the biggest um, <clears throat> shocks that I've seen in, in my students when I was teaching uh, college students uh, last, last semester, um, and for an assessment, <clears throat> they handed them in and I gave, uh, similar to you, um, sort of a generic response to common areas because there were a number of things that just, I could tell students, I don't know, some of it might've been on my part, maybe I hadn't given clear enough expectations for, for certain areas. Um, and there were other things that I think the students just didn't quite know how best to approach. Um, and when I took the assignments in for the first time and I identified quite quickly, there were a few common gaps. Um, and I then said to the students, you know, okay, here's a few things I've noticed. Here's some things that I was expecting. And here are some things that, you know, maybe you could think about um, who wants to have another go. And they were just shocked at even being given the chance. You know, they were so surprised to say, well, you're going to let us try again. And I said, you know, why wouldn't I? Um, they said, but the deadline's up. I said, well, I'll change the deadline. You know, you, you, you've all handed something in, but I believe you could do better. And if you think you could do better, um, then have a go. And if you think this is your best work, if you believe this is the best you can give me, then that's great too. But I want to give you the chance to do what you believe is the best. And I've never seen such a, uh, a, a, an audience of, of shock amongst the students. But, you know, lo and behold, what I got back the following week as their, as their true final product. Some of them left it, you know, some of them said, no, I'm happy with that. I think that's, I put a good effort into that and that's what, I, what I'm happy with. And some of them were very keen to, to take that back and have another go. And it was just a higher, higher <clears throat> output across the board. Um, and I was very impressed and they were very happy to have the chance. Um, and that's something that I've now, that, at that time, it was quite, kind of an emergent response. I just noticed something. And now that's just become part of my standard practice with assessment. Um, and, and the students really like having that opportunity um, and that kind of trust as well involved there. I think there's a, there's a trust element to that. Um, and it's just, it, it, it developed the relationship between me and the students, as well as just raising the standard of the work I was getting from them. And you, you mentioned trust and relationships. And I think that this is where that is, has to be mutual, you know, that they're, right. they're trusting Absolutely. that we're giving them the best and that we want them to, to perform. The, the, the trust comes in that we have to trust the students to not just turn in any old thing at the beginning right. because they right. know they're gonna get another go at it, which yeah. is something I hear teachers voice as a complaint or a worry, but I would argue that once you set up the class culture as yeah. mutual respect, Absolutely. that won't happen. You yeah. know, that, that's yeah. not likely to happen. Yes, yeah. you'll get a few. Of course. But largely you will get students in all sorts of different, uh, pro I don't know, different um, points in the process. You know, yeah. there will be the student who said, look, I had other things to do, or I was yeah. tired, or I was sick, yeah. and I didn't do my best, and I'd like another chance at it. I think we need to break down the us and them and really think about if I were in their shoes, would I want another right. opportunity? Right, right. Yeah. No, I Give think them the two, benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. No, I think there's two things you said there that were, were really valuable. Um, one is, you know, that that trust being mutual and that, that idea of building a classroom culture around that. Um, one of the th things that I think really contributes to that and, and ensures that you're going to be getting the student's best work is um, being clear with them as to why you're doing a certain thing the way you're doing it. So why am I assessing you this way? Why have I asked you to do this task? Not just because it's the exam or it's the end of the month or the end of the unit, but because you know I think by approaching it this way, 
this is what you'll get out of it. This is how it will help me assess you and know what to do next. And when students have a clearer idea of why you're doing things the way you're doing them, they, in my experience, have always been much more eager to contribute and put the effort in because they know there's some meaning to it where, again, traditionally, um, you know, the traditional assessment approach has just been kind of exams and an essay. And that's the way we do it because that's the way we've always done it. And the students can tell that the teacher doesn't really care enough for the students yeah. to have to care. You know, why would they want to put all of their effort in if the, stu if the teacher seems to be doing, in some cases, uh, you know, the bare minimum. Okay, here's an essay question, write the answer and I'll give you a mark. Uh, it doesn't look like I care, so why are the students going to care? And as soon as I was showing my students, um, you know, look, I want this assessment to be something meaningful. We're going to spend longer on it. There's going to be higher standards than normal, but here's how I'm going to assess you. Here's the way I want you to think about it. As soon as I was open with them about why I was doing things the way I was doing them, uh, I got such a higher standard of, of work from my students. And, you know, I, I have had students come to me after an exam or an assessment, not an exam, um, and thank me for an assessment because of what they got out of it. They learned something about themselves or they learned something deeper about the subject that they that they you know weren't expecting to get because they would normally hate doing exams and they were enjoying the assessment process which was for me you know that was an eye-opener that was something i'd never expected to hear was it was thanks after an assessment um but I, that openness and just clarity behind the process uh, which again you know we talked earlier about the focus being on process and here you know coming from both sides the students process and the teachers process the more open we are and the more focused we are on process the better the results i found Right. And a, another point, or just to reiterate that point that you made about clarity and setting the parameters at the outset, yeah. now you've created a shared understanding of those desired right. learning outcomes right. with right. students. And that, you know, with as we move towards more performance based assessment uh, activities, that provides for student choice. And when you have the yes. student choice, the parameters, the that has to be clear. How am I going to um, be, you know, how do I share the, the learning objectives with them before, during, and after the process yeah. to make sure that we're all on the same page? Yeah. Uh, that doesn't have to change. And that can be of a very high standard. Right. And then they'll see that they can reach that because you're supporting them through the process. Exactly right. Yeah. And because it's meaningful, right? It's something that has an has a, has a application and a meaning um, that you know they can they can reach it because uh, it relates to them in some way. Um, it's within their wheelhouse in some way that again most kind of traditional exams just are not. They're so detached from the real learning purposes um, that that the students kind of they can't relate to them. Uh, something else I want to pick up because I think it could get it could get glossed over and it could seem uh, insignificant, but I think it's something quite valuable. You said you know students might come to you and say. I didn't have time. I had something else to do, or you know, I was I was busy doing that thing. Um, I think some teachers might not hear uh, hear comments like that from their students because you're more likely to get excuses. And I think actually there's something very refreshing about just having a student come and honestly tell you, um, you know, look, I uh, I didn't have time. I didn't get around to it because I was doing this other thing that isn't school related. You know, not, oh, I've got so much homework and I don't have time. I think all teachers have heard that. But, you know, I've had students come and tell me, look, when it's my mature students, it's because of work. Or when it's my younger students, it's because of they fell out with a, a friend or whatever it is. I've had students come and tell me just honestly, look, uh, you know, there's no excuse for this, but I was focused on another thing. I was distracted with this. Um, is there any way I can get some, some extra time on this? And the reason that they can come and tell me that is because they know the kind of response they're going to get from me. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fly off the handle. I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to understand. And they're not going to, it's not going to be, you know, completely, uh, it's not going to lack, lack all consequence. You know, they know that they've, they know that they've not put in the effort as well. So there has to be some kind of a consequence to it. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think that, it sounds like you're getting that kind of honesty from your students, um, most likely because you're giving that kind of honesty to your students. But I do think a lot of teachers might not be. You know, I think a lot of teachers are much more familiar with just kind of generic boilerplate excuses. Um, and uh, and again, it's all a part of classroom culture. If you're honest and open with your students, you can expect them to be much more honest and open with you. Um, and again, the relationship that comes out of that and the value for learning that comes out of that, I think, is. Um, it should not be should not be taken lightly.
Yeah, and I wonder, I mean, that's an, a, another topic, this idea of why do teachers, why do we observe our colleagues and why do we sometimes fall into that trap of the chasing and the chasing right. up, and the how come they're not doing and there's something going on behind the scenes there with why why we we fall into that kind of almost stereotypical role of, of a teacher when we know that's not the way we really feel. Again, something that maybe we should have a little reflection about why yeah, why do yeah, we do right. that? Where is that really coming from? Because it, it's probably pressure and fear on the teacher for something that they're they're not quite understanding. But back to your point about this, uh, you know, empathy, this is something I've seen remarked upon in many arenas now in, in, during, during COVID is this incredible capacity for empathy that people are showing. Yeah. And we're showing it as well in education with our students when we allow them to be honest with us and not assume things that we, we don't really know. And that's right. where... I, I keep telling myself I've never gone wrong when I have just stopped and said, tell me what's going on as right. opposed to assuming yeah. that they weren't doing yeah. it because they're worried about their other course and they're not right. listening to my course and you know, all right. those things. I, I, again, it, it comes back to that common sense. We know it. Do we always do it? Do, do we recognize that in this fog that we're under right now? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, so. yeah. I think one other barrier that gets in the way of that as well. Um, um, there's something scary about opening up that the that relationship of openness and honesty. Um, there's something, you know, quite scary potentially because when you allow your students to come and be honest with you, there's the distinct possibility that they might have things to say that you didn't, you weren't ready for. Um, they might have complaints about your teaching and they might have, you know, comments on the content that you're delivering and various other things that otherwise would have gone on unsp unspoken. Um, and, you, you know, you could have gone on teaching the same thing the same way year after year and never changing and being despised for it by your students year after year, but never knowing. Um, and of course, that's bad for everybody, but it doesn't hurt your ego. Um, and so I think a lot of, for a lot of teachers, it's, it's much more comfortable to just kind of stay in that status quo of um, bad practice unspoken. Um, but once you start, you know, I've found this myself, you know, once my students realize that we have kind of a, 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 an environment of honesty, a classroom culture built on, on openness and honesty, um, they're much more ready to come and tell me that they didn't like something, um, which is great because I get to change it but the first couple of times it happened it was a bit of a bruise you know it's okay well uh, but of course you know that's the kind of thing that you have to you have to take on and grow with rather than reject or or or, or you know get angry about or point blame about which is again quite you know it's a, a, it's a sadly common response to these things but I find that you know there's yeah there's a bit of a growth period to go through but it's so valuable when you have that kind of openness well I I believe that that is a direct result of, well, let me put it this way. I've only felt, I've only had negative feedback when I've done something in my class that I kind of knew deep down that so it wasn't yeah. the right yeah. way to go, yeah. but yeah. I was doing it because it's always been done that way. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, when I've come through with honesty, vulnerability and empathy, I haven't had the feedback of that was a bad lesson, miss. Right. Yeah. But when I know that the practice that I'm doing or the challenge to a behavior or the confrontation, when I know deep down that that doesn't feel right, that's when I've gone off. And maybe yeah. this is coming out of teachers having had for years of having had to, to, to do these things that we right. don't believe in in the right. classroom and we right. know it's not good for students, but we do it and then we have to justify it and prop it up. Yeah, yeah. For years uh, we've been doing yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, 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 and maybe that makes it harder for the, you know, for the, the longer service teachers, teachers who've been in, in, in the classroom for longer because they've been doing it for so much longer. Um, you fall into a habit perhaps is the, you know, one, one way of looking at it. And also you have a bit of a sunk cost fallacy going on where, well, 
after all these years of telling the story, if I now today break line, isn't that going to seem like such a, uh, such, isn't it going to undermine everything? And of course, that is a danger, but it's all about then where are we tomorrow, right? We can hold yeah. that off because I want to, you know, not break the illusion that I've been keeping for so long um, because today will be painful if I do. But then tomorrow, suddenly we're in a whole new world where we can start from the ground up and build a whole new thing. Um, so breaking through that barrier, I think, can be, again, quite scary, but it opens up such a world of possibility. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the exciting part. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Sure. Good. So uh, if, uh, if we can round up, um, I'd like to go back briefly over the things that you've um, that you've talked about um, and just uh, just see if you have any ideas right now um, at this stage as to how you might bring some of these things with you when you go back to the classroom once the distance learning period is over what uh, what are you expecting to keep up that you've developed in this in this period and you think will translate well when you go back to the classroom I would say uh, slowing down on the assignments, trying mm -hmm. to stick with the process. It's something a colleague and myself, we were trying to put into practice right before we went in. We said, hey, let's slow down on this Othello essay and yeah. let's focus on process. So let's go back and do that. So I'm going to try to bring that back and really make an attempt to stick with the assignment for longer. Yeah, great. I'm also going to bring in the idea of shorter is sweeter and try to not blah, 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 to my yeah. students all the time yeah. with content blah, 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 and let them try to discover some of the, the things that we find beautiful about literature and language. Yeah, yeah. I think the same as well about the slowing down. You've mentioned Othello and I had a bit of a grin there as well because, you know, Shakespeare uh, is one of these things. Othello is Shakespeare, right? Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things. That, <laughs> uh, so it's a while since I read Shakespeare. Uh, it's one of those things that, um, <clears throat> you know, we all know on some level, uh, we all know of the possible beauty to find in some of these works of literature, be it Shakespeare or, or any of the other classics. Um, but of course, for the students, the focus is so much on getting the essay right and getting the, that they don't have any chance to actually appreciate the value of the literature you know, sitting and reading for the fun of reading and for the joy of reading and, and appreciating a play for its, for its beauty and its artistic value um, is sadly something students aren't actually encouraged to do. They have to read it all, but not so that they can enjoy it and appreciate it, but so that they can write the essay at the end. And so slowing down on that, um, you know, hopefully will also spawn some new joy of literature perhaps in the students. Yeah, exactly. And we've been, again, enforced because of the current situation we've been forced to change the way we're teaching that play to this is for another class but my colleague and i say let's let them watch it they're in the oh, perfect yeah, right. position yeah. to do that like yeah. why would we push them through like yeah. what is the purpose what is the ultimate purpose about why we bring out our you know text of yeah. shakespeare when yeah. it's meant to be watched yeah why not yeah. let them study exactly it right. that way yeah this so, is a friend of mine yeah please go yeah yeah, so I we we're rethinking, and now we have the freedom to do it because yeah, we're great. released from the shackles of that uh, text and, and allowing yeah. them to enjoy the different versions that are out there, yeah. from the yeah. good version yeah. to the, you know, the whatever the movie ver Hollywood ver right. versions, yeah, and yeah, do comparisons. They're still thinking. They're still making points. They're justifying a position. They're taking a stand yeah. on something. That's what we're trying to teach in writing. Yeah. yeah. And surely if we want them to read, if we want them to, to, to spend time reading, then give them a novel, right? And, and, and yeah. let them watch plays and read novels because that's what it's there all, you go. that was designed, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, listen, Emma, that's great. Uh, if there's anything else you want to add before we finish? Um, no, it's just, I encourage people, well, I do, yeah, yes, I'll add something. I encouraging people to do their own reflection and follow yeah. in yeah. what they know to be the right thing, which is you make a plan, you implement it, and then you evaluate it. And reflection is part of that. And, and, yeah. and when teachers do that and you afford yourself the time to reflect on your practice, yeah. you can't yeah. go wrong with that. So Yeah, that's great. Reflecting, uh, listen, keep just moving. 
for the value of, of anybody else who might be kind of beginning to think on that, have you found any particular benefit? So you make them a as videos instead of writing and you explained earlier why you do that, uh, but then you upload the videos. Uh, is there any particular benefit to you? You think, uh, do you think you get anything extra out of it because you then are committed to uploading them? Do you think that that, that adds anything to it for you? Uh, it keeps me doing them because right, yeah, it's nice. easy not to do mm. them. Uploading, I think, shares the wealth. I've been told that people appreciate the vulnerability and the truthfulness. And when I can show other teachers that it's okay to be vulnerable and to mess up and yeah. fail, for, that's just gold. People love yeah. it because yeah. they feel like we're all in it together. So it yeah, helps to build great. community. Yeah. By uploading, I can I can build that community, and um, I I will say though that the pressure to produce one every day is sometimes too much, and sure. sometimes I say today I'm not doing one, yeah, and I yeah. just take yeah. a break. Like yeah. you don't have to hold yourself to the the that the the chain that you put yourself in. You know, you yeah. you, you can yeah. yourself be a little free with it, but I think it forces me to stay focused and to. Um, continue to improve. That's really what that that process has done for me, and yeah, and share with with colleagues. You know that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so you, we we talked a little bit earlier about some of the responses that you've had from the students. Have you had any responses from other teachers that have seen your uh, reflections and any of the feedback or the responses or the comments that they've given? Uh, they, uh, I would say yes um, from colleagues, but not in not necessarily in my own school in my own environment you know they know me so they know sure. my process and that connection's already there and i sure. run a, a plc local plc oh, with okay. my own nice. school Brilliant. so we share Brilliant. things in there but the 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 connection with educators around the world including yeah. you and and other people is phenomenal and i'm That's i'm great. excited to hear what's happening in australia what's happening in indonesia what's happening yeah, yeah, in yeah. education in different environments to me that makes it even better I, i'm yeah. more excited to share uh, and to to hear what other people are doing and saying and and so that so yeah that's Excellent. uh but I've got, I've got positive things. But again, the thing that people like to see is show me where you've messed up and how you yeah, fixed it. Yeah, yeah. Something that has been hidden for so long, right? Something that we edit out or hide so much that, that everybody learns from that, I think. That's really great. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so when I put this up, um, I'll add some links and things. Um, so maybe I'll put links to your YouTube and, and things like that along with it. Is there anything else you want to um, point people in the direction of uh, as we finish off here? Anything else that you want people to check out or? Um, I think that there is a summit coming up on May 28th called The New Way Forward. Okay. And I'll send you a link for that. That was a very inspiring okay. uh, webinar to be, be in because it, 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 was, yeah, it was inspiring about what could be, what could school look like. And so the folks who put that together, it was exciting and invigorating to be involved in that if you're interested in big big ideas, big thinking, mm -hmm. big yeah. philosophy. Um, and then in the practical sense, again, like I said, Ed Space was helpful to hear what other teachers are struggling with and thinking about. And um, other than that, no. Uh, oh, there, there are lots of different little things that, that, that people are putting out now for COVID types instruction, but good instruction is good instruction and so uh, I really like Cult of Pedagogy. I think the oh, work yeah. that yeah. Jennifer's doing over there yeah. is good under any circumstances. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, I can definitely agree with you on that one. Fantastic uh, wealth of resource from her, yeah. Okay. All right, great, thanks so much, Emmy, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to stay in touch and maybe do another one of these sometime in the future. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to seeing um, uh, the other people that you're gonna be talking to and yeah, where too. are you? Where are you thinking about hosting these? Uh, so in the intermediate time, I'll be uploading them to LinkedIn, but I want to uh, probably put them on YouTube and maybe on a website somewhere. Um, and uh, I will post updates about that as I work it out. Perfect, okay, right. excellent. And you're in Jakarta now, right? I am, yeah, yeah. yeah and, it, and things are okay, people are healthy and... Yeah, yeah, I think I think um, in many ways the same as much of the rest of the world. You know, it's we're we're dealing with it. Um, the uh, 
the news that we're getting, we're kind of following the developments and we're taking that as it comes. Um, I've been in my apartment now for, I don't know how many weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're all kind of having some version of that experience. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm with you there, but, uh, all right, great. Super. Yeah. All right. We'll Carry stay healthy on. and, uh, we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch. Thanks a lot. Emma. All right. Ciao. Bye. Bye. -bye.